Please let me introduce Dr. Yves de Villiers. He is a professor of neurology and physiology and head of the clinical and research activity of the sleep laboratory at the University of Montpellier. He is also coordinator of the French National Reference Network for Orphan Diseases and director of one research group in the Institute of Neuroscience, again in Montpellier in France. Dr. de Villiers is also vice president of the European Narcolepsy Network and vice president of the French Sleep Medical and Research Society. He is the author or co-author of more than 525 papers published in international and national peer-reviewed journals, several book chapters, and he also edited three French book-related um, contributions to sleep medicine. I also happen to know he's an awesome surfer. So welcome, Dr. de Villiers. Thanks, Claire, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be with you today. It's a long trip for France, but um, very nice to visit uh, Houston, no? Not sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the title is quite long, and, but I will focus uh, as promised uh, on Ayurvedic hypersomnia today. But I, I want to start with uh, some definition and, and some uh, complex story to separate what is complaint, what is disease, and how to assess. And I think this is key because uh, a lot of patients complain about problems, sleep problems, but at the end of the day, we need to define exactly the reason why they should complain to, uh, to go to personalized medicine. So we did this uh, review published in Lancet uh, two years ago to divide it that hypersomnolence is complex um, uh, phenomena that should be divided in two uh, also complex symptoms. One is excessive time sleepiness with a lot of different phenotypes uh, to be sleepy during the day with sleep attacks, planned or unplanned naps with long naps or uh, short naps, automatic behavior, attention problem, brain fog being the feeling of drowsiness all day long. So even just excessive time sleepiness is not a poor sleepiness scale above 10, is more than that for sure. And sometimes it's too simple to just sum up EDS with this a poor scale. And because we are doctor and we need to spend time with the patient to make, uh, to, to understand exactly the complaint. And so the clinical interview is key. Uh, you need to spend time to listen to, for the different uh, symptoms that may, uh, really uh, be the burden of uh, the, the problem and uh, as a consequence, cognition problem, accidentology, attention problem, and sometimes even more problem. But I have no time to discuss on that, but cardiovascular disease could be one. So to assess exactly and to be reliable between center and to define some criteria, you need to go to objective measurement and uh, with actigraphy, with sleep recording, and I will spend time on that. And after, you need to define what should be the main causes that may explain these symptoms. NT1, NT2, IH, sleep disorder breathing, sleep deprived, drugs, neurological disorder, and sometimes it's a combination of several of them. In the other part is hypersomnia. Hypersomnia is increased need for sleep, so it's a long sleep. It could be just during the night, during the day, with long naps or could be uh, night and day, and is often associated with sleep inertia. Again, you need a good clinical interview, and you need to separate what is weekdays, what is weekend days, vacation, because when you need to wake up at seven, because you work, you cannot uh, discuss about long sleep. So you need really to focus on a uh, weekday and a day off. <coughs> Again, you need uh, a good assessment, quantitative assessment, again for criteria to be sure the diagnosis and to be reliable between labs, to have not uh, your own experience, but experience that should be shared with the others. And to do so, you need longer P uh, polysomnography recording, and I will spend time on that again. And different etiology that may be associated with hypersomnia, IH, long sleepers, drugs, neurological disorder, psychiatric disorder, and to make this point even more complex, you can have EDS and hypersomnia. So it's complex, but I think it's nice 
not just to say that the patient is A plus above 10, so is IH or is uh, hypersomnolence. You, we need to go more in details. So we did it, uh, this kind of uh, algorithm to uh, try to uh, understand the prevalence of the problem in 16,000 subjects from general population in, in US with uh, Maurice O'Hayon several years ago. <coughs> and the objective was exactly just what I say, excessive sleepiness at least three times per week, at least two times a day, more than uh, three months without being sleep deprived. And the duration, the, the prevalence is 4%. If you go to naps, you need uh, to quantify number of naps, how many times a week without being sleep deprived and how long that it takes is 0.7. And the main sleep with more than nine hours being unrefreshing uh, sleep because you can still complain even if you sleep more than nine hours is 1.2. So it's not at all rare disease, it's a very frequent problem. So an IH is rare disease. So where are uh, the, the problem in between? So the problem is also when you want to record the problem and uh, with different tools and uh, what you can expect it from the tools. So to quantify excessive daytime sleepiness, there is at least two, this MSLT, you know that is mostly for narcolepsy uh, because the time to fall asleep is quick and in REM sleep mostly. And you can do the MWT is the opposite direction is to fight against sleepiness 40 minutes and is with some uh, implication for uh, driving uh, to be sure that you are safe for you and for the society. If we want to go now to uh, hypersomnia in terms of long sleep, how can we measure that? So first you need a good clinical interview to answer the big question about how much sleep do we need and how much sleep do you, we really sleep? This is really simple question, but the answer is not, is not uh, as simple as the question. And there is several um, answer to that. Mostly you need to sleep between seven to eight hours, but this is the mean. The mean mean nothing for a given subject. So, you have short sleeper below six hours, but most of short sleeper are sleep deprived. They say, I need five, six, but it's not the case because when you put patient in a bed, he will sleep longer than that. So is, they are sleep deprived. And long sleeper is the same, you know, they complain that they need 10, 11, 12 hours. Uh, it's quite frequent, I say two to 8% of the general population, but there is a different phenotype as well. Some subject do not complain on daytime functioning if they can sleep enough during the night. Okay, this is really long sleepers. Other complain of excessive quantity of sleep, but still during the day, they cannot function uh, properly with uh, alteration of uh, the, the, cogni the cognition and uh, alertness. And other, and this is also frequent, the patient complain about long sleep, but at the end, they didn't sleep as long as they, they, they report. And we call that clinophilia, you know, is they correlated the time in bed at the time asleep, but it's not the case. And it's this, so it's overestimated of sleep time. Exactly the opposite as we do see in insomnia, they increase the perception of the number of duration of awakening at night. So the huge heterogeneity in the sleep assessment, and if you do that face-to-face, -face, by phone, by internet, by questionnaire, the wording of the questionnaire, and I just propose here the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale, and I will come back on that in a minute, but here is just to show you that the two first item was dedicated to the long sleep, in optimal condition. So mostly when you are during vacation, how much sleep do you need? And is that enough to function uh, correctly during the day? And also for the prevalence is depend on the target population related to the age, uh, the gender, in context of uh, neurological disorder, psychiatric disorder. And again, if you look for weekdays, weekend days and so on. So that's, that's quite complex. And we did the same with the same survey with Maurice O'Hayon several years ago, more than 10 years ago. And we do see that eight, 
percent of the general population do complain of long sleep, more than nine hours, and with uh, functional problem during the day in 1%. So it's not again, IH is not again a rare disease, is very frequent, 1% of general population. <coughs> if you want to record that objectively, that's complex. Uh, you need to standardize the procedure and to be reliable uh, between different labs. And what we do in uh, our lab in Montpellier, it's quite complex. But uh, I think we have a large experience on that, and I will explain you the reason why we do so. So we start with PLG MSLT to exclude narcolepsy, to exclude uh, OSAS, uh, per -de leg movement, etc., sleep deprived. And when you do have in mind that the patient should be affected with IH because of the key complaint but it, of uh, hypersomnolence, but cannot be explained by your first PhD and MSLT, we ask the patient to come back. We do the PhD and modify MSLT. The patient cannot sleep more than one minute. So we quantify the sleep propensity, but after we wake up the patient because you do not disturb the night that will follow the MSLT to pr prevent the problem of the sleep homeostasis. And after we put the patient in, uh, in a bed for one night, one day, and one night, this is uh, different than what most of people do is mostly 24 hours. But for us, the second night is key for the diagnosis of IH. If uh, a normal subject uh, do this uh, test, he will, so it's without uh, light, it's a small light, he can read for sure, but he cannot open the, uh, the, the window and uh, he, he just ask for meal, he have no watch, no uh, TV, uh, no uh, iPhone. He, the objective is to sleep as long as he can because he, he complained about long sleep. So we want to, to not be disturbed by uh, external influences. So if the patient wake up around, uh, as you can see here, better than me, probably at 8 a.m. Uh, and he have a long naps of two hours and the second night will be a little bit shorter because he have a long naps of uh, two hours. But the, the subject uh, uh, in the back is wake up, as you can see at 1 p.m. with uh, you know seven, even eight cycle after just two hours of being wake up, he go to a, a, a long naps of two cycle. And after at a, a, a 8 p.m., another naps. So he's, he's very, very sleepy, 26 hours across 32. So it, you need to individualize that and to understand the reason why. And I will come back on that after. So the main etiology of being uh, with this uh, hypersomnolence, so EDS and or hypersomnia could be uh, OSAS, obesity, sleep deprived, circadian rhythm, neurological disorder, psychiatric disorder, substance intake, depression, ADHD. But the more severe problem is NT1, NT2, IH, and klein levin syndrome. So you know the, the revised uh, criteria for um, the three main disorder. Uh, NT1, NT2, and IH, but there is not too much change, you know, after nine years, because the last one was two, 2014, and just uh, uh, last year uh, they came with a revision, but the revision is just few words uh, uh, for 300 pages, just few words. And for IH, there is almost no change, unfortunately. And it's when I say unfortunately is because we do see a lot of overlap. Uh, and in, in, in the, the Bible, so in the ICST3 uh, TR right now, it's three separate conditions, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, you know, NT1, NT2, and IH. But in reality, it's not correct because we do see a lot of overlap. So. NT1 is with cataplexy and orex indeficiency completely on the left uh, part of the figure. In IH, we do see uh, this very long sleep recording, 26 hours, remember, across 32. So there is almost no time to, to, to function during the day. And with brain fog, sleep inertia, and so on. 
And in between, we do have this NT2 with some, uh, you know, characteristic with, that are in common with narcolepsy, especially the REM sleep propensity during the day on this MSLT. But also, they have normal orexin and sometimes sleep inertia, as we can see as well in idiopathic hypersomnia. So it's complex and is not very separate entity. So we need to know that because for a given subject, it's not nice to say one day you are affected with IH and another day NT2 is the same subject. So it's because our criteria are not good. This is the reason why I think we need to update this criteria. It's not the criteria that define a disease. The disease need to be defined by the complaint of the subject and the exam should confirm the diagnosis, but not the opposite. And the story is even more complex because based on the criteria, you know, NT1 is NT1, okay, you cannot change. And fortunately, your Rx in uh, neurons are gone, so it cannot come back spontaneously. But NT2 is rarely, uh, you know, a way to go to NT1 because we have still everywhere in the world eight, eight years to be diagnosed with NT1. So for sure, if you have six months or one year, a lot of NT2 will develop NT1, but because we are unlucky to see patient after years, the story is already uh, uh, behind us and uh, their orex in neurons are no more there. But NT2 can be an IH, IH could be NT2 or even sometimes remission. But what does it mean remission? No complaint or normalized in the results of the test, MSLT, polysomnography, so what does it mean to uh, be a normal? Is normal absence of complaint? And sometimes it's tricky because the patient is still treated with drugs. So how can, how can you say that is in a good uh, uh, natural perspective and evolution and if it's still managed with drugs? It doesn't mean that he need the drugs. He's still treated with drugs. So with experts in the field from Europe, we decided to propose some uh, revision for the the, the criteria, but it was not taken into account for the ICSC 3 TR. So we wanted, as uh, again, European expert, that narcolepsy type 1, type 2 should be narcolepsy spectrum, you know, with some orexin deficiency, but it's not uh, black and white or yes or no. There is a continuum with some cutoff, uh, but cutoff again can be uh, discussed. Idiopathic hypersomnia in, in green is really a very long sleep uh, subject with sleep inertia, and you need to exclude sleep deprived or circadian rhythm. And in between, we do have some sleepy subject without long sleep time, without sleep inertia. And for this subject, it's probably more the, the, the subject who uh, may change time to time because we are not able right now to really um, uh, make a good uh, diagnosis with the tools we do have to be sure of this entity. But the problem is to change the name for insurance company. And so uh, uh, at the end, they didn't accept to revise that. But I think it's more close to reality to the complaint of the subject. He's narcoleptic because when we say he's type one, type two, especially in US, nobody do tap in routine to measure orexin. So it's very hard to say you are type one orexin deficient if you did not measure orexin. So it's, you come back to with cataplexy and so on. And for sure, we have some links with depression, with fatigue, with attention problem. So I think it's, we need to think a little bit out of the box and not just to update the criteria just to think about NT1, NT2, IH is something more uh, with a continuum. I will not spend too much time on NT1 because uh, uh, it's not the topic of today, but is the disease we know a lot, a lot. Uh, EDS, cataplexy, uh, biomarker with orexin, HLA, uh, the MSLT is quite nice uh, to diagnose the dispatient. And uh, so we want to do exactly the same for IH tomorrow or in the next uh, decades. And I have no time to go there. Um, and we do know, uh, uh, as probably all of you know as well, this orexin deficiency in the brain. Uh, so it's uh, mostly related to autoimmune disorder in humans compared to uh, uh, several species with uh, mutation in the genes of the receptor 2 of orexin. 
And what is nice on the right is, as you can see, typical cataplexy are mostly uh, associated with low orexin level, okay? Typical cataplexy, we do, we do know what that means in terms of the trigger, the duration, the frequency, and so on. But as you can see, 10% probably are above the threshold of 200 at that time. It was performed 15 years ago. If you go to uh, narcolepsy without cataplexy, it's the, the reverse. You have 20% with orexin deficiency and 80% with orexin normal. So you cannot really predict for a given subject what will be the level of orexin in narcolepsy. But in IH, it should be normal. If not, if not, it's supposed to be within the spectrum of narcolepsy. But again, to be sure of that, you need to measure orexin because tomorrow that will change the, the way we will manage the patient, certainly. And orexin is, uh, is very important because it may help to understand why you are sleepy or why you are awake in a balanced way, what we so-called the flip-flop model. And uh, it's nice to, uh, to know that orexin will trigger, will promote the activity of monoaminergic neurons in the brain, histamine neurons, uh, norepinephrine neurons, serotonin neurons. And when they are active, that explain why you are awake. In contrast, when you are asleep, your uh, GABAergic neurons in the VLPO, so in the hypothalamus, anterior hypothalamus, will uh, um, decrease the firing of this orexin and monoaminergic neurons. So that really explain why you are sleepy, why you are uh, in trouble. It's not just orexin. The orexin is in green, but there is a lot of other player. And why, what is of interest is because it's the treatment for tomorrow to target exactly what you need and what you want for a given subject, again, to go to precision medicine. So where we are for narcolepsy is complex. Genetics, environment, to explain why there is no more orexin and to look for the consequences of having no more orexin. So, but for IH, where we are and where we should go. So it's often young female for several reasons I have no time to explain. Mostly is familiar cases, but it's not well studied, unfortunately. And for the clinic, there is three major symptoms that I try to convince you already. EDS, prolonged nighttime sleep, and often associated with prolonged nighttime sleep, sleep inertia. To quantify that, we propose the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale that is able to assess the three different symptoms and not just a poor sleep in a scale that is for everybody, sleep deprived, OSAS, narcolepsy. So it cannot fit with uh, exactly the complaint of the subject. And the consequences on daily life of having all of these three symptoms is assessed with this IHSS. It's not just the frequency of the symptoms, it's the consequences of having the symptoms on daily life. For sure, some of the symptoms are not in, and we can discuss that for a long time, hours and hours, fatigue, brain fog, but the, of depression, and uh, uh, the, the problem is, is not specific, it's pro some problem to translate, but also the frequency, the duration, and uh, we wanted to keep going with specific symptoms, but it doesn't mean that there is no other symptom associated depending on the subject. So this is the questionnaire we were able to make some uh, range uh, for cutoff and uh, of interest is, is nice to, um, <coughs> to quantify the symptoms, but also and mo mostly to reduce, to see that with drug intake, you will reduce the severity of uh, the, the severity of the symptom assessed with this scale. And we define some cutoff for untreated subject, treated subject or patient with the disease compared to the controls. This 14 item is just, uh, I may say, uh, five minutes to, to complete. So this is based for a clinical assessment and after how to diagnose the patient. You cannot just diagnose with a complaint. So um, MSLT is part of the game and uh, David Rye here proposed for the first time this uh, lovely uh, test, retest, 
uh, results of the MSLT to show for the first time that it's really not reliable, both for the latency and for the number of sleep onset REM period. And in my lab and also in uh, Emmanuel Mignot's lab, we did that uh, uh, several years after to confirm exactly what he, he reported the first time that is not reliable. So if it's not reliable, it cannot be the gold standard. So we need to do more. Uh, what we, I think you are probably not aware of that because this recent publication we did, and I think it's nice, uh, I make that simple, uh, uh, hopefully. We love this test, the MSLT, since uh, three decades, four decades. But the way to assess is just two items, as you know, the latency and the number of SOREM. But you can play with a lot of other items, you know, on the, the test you, you do on a daily basis, you know, is the duration of sleep each nap, you know, the duration of REM sleep each night, not just the latency to go to REM. And uh, the shift, you know, uh, the sequences, if you go to REM with N2 in between or just N1 and REM, the value of the first test or the last test, you know, you can play a lot, not just on two items. Because here in, in, in this figure, there is uh, two patients with narcolepsy, you know, because the MSLT is below eight minutes and more than two SOREM, but it's not at all the same results, but it's so-called narcolepsy at the end. It's not correct. So we play with that in uh, around 400 subjects uh, with orexin measurement. And we can separate what may explain, you know, the orexin deficiency to show the results of the MSLT to predict in narcoleptic patient for NT1, NT2, and for IH as well. And of interest, what pop up as the first uh, you know, item is not latency, is not the number of SOREM. But in the classification, it's why uh, we, we need to follow that uh, currently. So the best marker that separate the subject is the mean duration in REM sleep in the five tests. So it, it's just to think a little bit out of the box, but for the same test you do in routine. So that may help for a better diagnosis in patients with complaint of hypersomnolence. So this is for MSLT, uh, not to put that uh, in the garbage, uh, but uh, also to think a little bit differently to assess MSLT. What about long sleep recording? Again, there is a lot of, uh, uh, not a lot, but uh, at least three uh, nice reports using actigraphy because it's less expensive well accepted for the subject and is more ecological, uh, but it may really overestimate sleep and underestimate wakefulness during the day. So it's it's not good, uh, and also the, the it's not standardized in terms of uh, the items and uh, you you will put for the different threshold, and so it, it's not reliable uh, for um, hypersomnolence. Uh, so we need alternative methods. So alternative method is long sleep recording with the police somnography, and there are several protocols and I, uh, with uh, variability. And uh, the one we do, uh, we, we use in, in Montpellier, I already uh, show you an, an, an example. And here is uh, a, a last subject. The, the two first, you, I already report that. But for the last one, uh, if you follow me, the patient will wake up at 11 uh, p.m. with at 12 another naps for one hour or so, and at uh, six sorry 4 p.m. he have another naps. If you stop the test after 24 hours, he's very long sleepers, so it could be IH. But if you let the patient sleep the second night, there is no sleep because he sleep all day long the first part of the night and from the first night and the big part during the first day. So if there is no more sleep the second night, it cannot be the same as the guy just above, you know, in the middle of the figure who continue to sleep the second night. So if we put everybody in the same box, we will never understand the disease and the neurobiology and the genetic uh, background, etc. So we need to do 
more to uh, understand the story for the pathophysiology. So we defined some cut some cutoff uh, with this test, uh, 19 hours, and it's of interest because there is a huge correlation with the MSLT as well. So the more uh, sleep you need at night, the more sleepy you will be during the day. So again, it's a continuum. It's not independent association. I like this uh, paper we published several years ago. It's, it's a complex figure, but let me explain a bit. The patient come to see you because of complaint of uh, excessive quantity of sleep, so prolonged nighttime sleep, for sleepiness during the day or for both. And after we proposed exactly the protocol, PHG, MSLT, and uh, the long sleep recording, and depending on the results, you can see if the patient is affected with isolated objective daytime sleepiness, so problem in MSLT but not in the uh, bed rest uh, uh, protocol, or just the problem in the bed rest protocol, so long sleepers or both, or neither nor uh, affected. So you have four boxes. And after you can look for uh, BMI, depression, microarousal, number uh, percentage of REM sleep of uh, N3. And at the end, you have a very deep understanding of what's going uh, wrong or good in your patient, you know, to eliminate, you know, uh, uh, periodic leg movement, a little bit of HI, macroarousal, and so on. And you are able to separate what is isolated objective daytime sleepiness, isolated hypersomnia, or objective EDS and hypersomnia. And we started with 266 subjects, and at the end, we go to 71 subjects. So to show you that is rare. But for this subject, we go to genetics, we go to neurobiology with the CSF, to metabolomic, to microbiota, to, uh, you know, we want to do the best to understand in this very uh, well phenotyped uh, population. And another marker we want to play with is sleep inertia, because this is also uh, a problem. We can quantify with three items sleep inertia on the IHSS. And we were interested in, in the past to look for objective assessment of sleep inertia. And we propose PVT, it's very known. Uh, and we propose that four times, 7 p.m., 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. to look for the change of the PVT as a function of your nighttime sleep. And you can do that also after a nap. And as you can see here, there's a huge association with the lapses, so the number of lapses during the PVT and the complaint of sleep inertia. So again, it's a reliable and objective measurement of sleep inertia, and that may help to really categorize the subject, not just based on a complaint, but based also on results. So where we are for IH? IH is defined by different symptoms, sleep inertia, EDS, long sleep at night. But what is the neurobiology that is wrong in the brain? Is it problem of sleep homeostasis, circadian dysfunction, immune dysfunction? And what about the trigger of that? G genetics, environment, and we want to understand that more. It's a, the, it's a lot of unresolved question, but I think it's nice to go there to really uh, put on the table the, the way to really answer the question asked. So for neurobiology, uh, there is a lot of uh, staff and money and time. And uh, David Wright did uh, first on GABA. We did also and on histamine, but nothing really striking. It's not uh, in our hands a deficiency in waking system or in either an excess in sleep system. Nothing very striking. For one subject, you can see something, but it's not really reproducible and reliable. And what we did uh, also last time in, uh, with uh, Lucy Barato, she's here, we uh, were interested in, in um, the measurement of the metabolite of uh, different uh, amine, biogenic amine, and uh, the trace amine in the CSF of 100 subject drug-free with complaint of sleepiness, NT1, NT2, IH, and some with that objective excessive sleepiness. And we stratified the subject also as a function of orexin deficiency or not but we find nothing. A lot of money, 
for at the end of the day, nothing. But it is the way to go. You know, it's research is like that, to phenotype at best and after to look for biomarker. And the, uh, another really exciting uh, result, probably you are aware of that, is uh, Masachi Yanagisawa published a lovely paper in Nature several years ago. For the first time, uh, very long mice, uh, very long sleeping mice. Uh, by uh, you know mutation in uh, in the in uh, the DNA of mice, and you can see mice that do do sleep all the time, all the time. You know there is no wake at all, as you can see on the left, and they found the gene that explained the fact that these mice do not sleep at all. Sorry, do uh, are, uh, do not wake at all, and they are sleepy all the daytime and nighttime. And it, it, they, they find the deletion of exon 13 in the six tree. So it is the first time there is really sleepy mice reproducible from one generation to another. So we decided to sequence this gene, especially in the subject very well defined and characterized, uh, as I told you, with the bed rest condition. There is one SNP that uh, is reliable in six tree, but we find nothing. So again, frustrating, but it's the way research uh, is ongoing, you know. But we find another gene on PERS3 that is supposed to be associated with circadian rhythm problem, and we find a, a variant there. So again, we need to continue in this direction, but it's costly. But uh, I think it's the way it, it works. Two, I have three minutes, so I need to stop. <coughs> Two minutes, OK. It's just to go to treatment intake, because uh, I know that Kieran Maskey already did it, so I don't want to spend too much time, but the big effort to understand the pathophysiology, the phenotype, uh, the diagnosis is at the end of the day to help the patient to go with, to personalize medicine. But before doing so, you need to better understand the disease. So reduce the excessive daytime sleepiness, decrease sleep inertia and prolonged nighttime sleep to treat comorbidity and big, big help of patient association. Uh, that is really mandatory for this chronic disease. And for narcolepsy, we have a lot of drugs, fortunately, but for IH, there is just one drug available in US and even not one in EU. So just the XI wave. And that's of interest to understand how drugs work uh, based on the mechanism of action when you give a drugs is for which reason. And uh, so there is some review to show that it may work, but not very actively because it may just works on excessive time sleepiness, the, the drugs we do have for uh, narcolepsy, except the uh, low sodium oxybate. And this study, you did see that uh, several times probably, is the first time we do see that there is an effect on ESS IHSS and sleep inertia. So it's the only drugs that drugs oxybate the mechanism of action that works on not EDS, but different symptoms of IH. And the perspective uh, in the field is really to go to good benefit risk balance, to uh, go to different assessment uh, with different questionnaire and different time to uh, listen to the patient. And what about new medication that may help the patient in a couple of years? We did a study with uh, sodium oxybate, uh, with polysomnography and MWT, and I will present the data on Tuesday. There is uh, a project with once nightly uh, sodium oxybate. Hopefully, it will be uh, available soon, start soon. You know that Peter Lisan uh, did a study as well not yet published, and Solorian Fetol, fortunately, I received a grant last year by Hypersonia Foundation, very happy with that, and we will start that uh, in a couple of uh, months. And what about orexin story? Orexin story is complex because they are, no, orexin is normal in this patient, as I told you. So why we should propose orexin staff in this population? Because it may work, you know, we didn't say that there is a problem in histamine and pitorizon may work in narcolepsy and there is same for sorriamfetol, there is no problem of dopamine that has been objectively assessed, I wanna say. And there is one study with TAC925 in IH that show that it may work on MWT in uh, very few subjects 
crossover, just one day, so it's to be cautious, just one day means not nothing, but it's just go and no go to say you can continue. But the oral drugs, the first one with the TAC 994 was lovely in NT1, not in IH, but they stop because of liver toxicity. So we are far for to find a drugs for IH with orexin receptor 2 activity. Who knows, but right now it's uh, still a, an hope than a really an answer. So my last slide, IH is a cause of central hypersomnolence disorder, is different than narcolepsy. We do have some tools for a good clinical assessment, EDS, prolonged nighttime sleep and sleep inertia. It's very heterogeneous phenotype and we cannot say that EPRUS is good and not enough for this population. PHG and SLT is not good enough as well. You need to really record long sleep, probably with new EEG uh, 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 bounds right now that are more and more available to, uh, to recall the patient for a long period of, of time at home and not just uh, in, within the hospital. We need to do more and more and more for to better understand the pathophysiology and the biology of IH. As I try to convince you, we play a lot on that. Frustrating so far, but uh, still some hope. And for the guidelines to better treat the subject, uh, non-pharma is key. Pharma, I try to convince you that we do have some drugs to fight against daytime sleepiness, but for uh, the whole comprehensive problem of sleep inertia and long sleep at night so far, there's just Oxybay that works. But we need to follow the patient because the burden of the disease is key and it's not just medication that will help the patient for decades. We need more. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.